It's time for our Bible study, and it's in Hebrews chapter 10, so get your Bibles out. This is one of the longer portions that we're going to study. Usually it's just five or six verses. This one, 18 of them. Why? Well, first of all, the theme of this particular section applies to the whole book of Hebrews from the beginning till now. And it's the message, once for all. And we've been building for that. But here's the interesting thing. Hebrews, if you study it in Hebrew, which most of you don't, you study it in English. But if you study it in Hebrew, the book of Hebrews is divided into two parts. Very clear. The first part goes from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter eighteen, uh, chapter 10, verse 18. So we will finish the whole first part of Hebrews this evening, Lord willing. Then at verse 19, it begins an application of all the doctrines that we've been learning about, the death of our Messiah and how wonderful uh, he is as our high priest. Lots of wonderful things. So there's the dividing point right after verse 18. So uh, let's take a moment to pray, and then we're going to read the text. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us this wonderful privilege. Thank you for Main Place giving us the opportunity to teach your word and to use the streaming live and facilities here to reach thousands of people. We just want to thank you and praise you. And Lord, I pray that you'll open up our hearts again to the once for all death of our Messiah, our Lord Yeshua. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. And may many turn to you before it's too late. We thank you in the blessed name of our Lord Yeshua. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Okay, you got your Bible handy. Here we go. Chapter 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged or cleansed should have had no more a conscious of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a what? What does it say? remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible. Now, if you ever wanted a clear-cut verse on this matter, here it is. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Amen? Amen. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Speaking of the Father. He taketh away the first, that's the covenant dealing with the law, that he may establish the second the new covenant, by the which will, his will, we are sanctified 
through the offering of the body of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and what's the next three words? There it is. That's the theme. Once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And here comes a wonderful verse. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission or forgiveness of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Is that not a beautiful passage? Thank you, Lord, for it. And we are going to emphasize once for all. And that occurs right at the end of verse 10. Now, um, the, studies that we, <clears throat> the studies that we've been doing in this book of Hebrews are coming now in chapter 10, verses 1 to 18, to the conclusion of the arguments regarding the person and work of the Messiah of Israel. And why it is, as we've already learned, much better than everything else you read in the Bible. Wow. That's a pretty strong statement. And as I've already mentioned, the doctrinal part of Hebrews is ending at verse 18 and beginning at chapter 10, verse 19, you will see the application of the practical exhortations regarding the marvelous work of the Messiah. The key words again are once for all. Now if you want to follow this, because there's 18 verses, there's a lot to think about. If you want to follow it, there are four issues in these 18 verses. Four of them. And it helps us to understand what the Messiah has done for us. So let's start with number one. Number one is the remembrance of sins. You know, it was always a problem. Israel had a terrible problem of this. There were two Levitical sacrifices, one called the sin offering and the other one called the trespass offering, dealing with this matter. But neither one of them could ever take away sin. And here's something else that's interesting. The sacrifices did the very opposite of what our Lord has done. And that is, they caused people to remember their sins. (laughs) It drove them crazy. But in our Lord, Messiah, Yeshua, there is no longer any remembrance of sin. It's a done deal. How many of you are glad that that's happening to your life? Oh, I got you all to admit you were sinners. Okay. Now what we have starting right off the bat in verses 1 to 3 is the importance of the law. And you know what? This is confusing. I've got several books on Hebrews, and Bible teachers are confused, in my opinion. Many of them, not all, but many of them are. What are they confused about? About the law. 
and what the law could do or could not do. Now, what I have seen among a lot of people who love God's Word, I've seen also the problem of ignoring and neglecting the importance of God's law. Never forget that the word Torah, Jews refer to the first five books and sometimes the whole Bible as Torah. What does Torah mean in Hebrew? Teaching. So it's very, very important. Romans 6.14, do you remember this verse? Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now sometimes the believers, not thinking correctly, I believe, have taken that verse to mean uh, we're free from the legalism of the law, to do whatever we want to do. That's not true. I think that's a part of the problem. The law still has significance and impact upon our lives today. There's nothing wrong with the law. Romans is very clear on that. It's a perfect revelation of God's standard of what is right and what is wrong. If somebody asks you, how do you know what's wrong? Well, we have to look at the Bible. Well, where are you going to look? I'm going to look at the law. Oh, you mean the Ten Commandments? Well, yes, but more than that. Because there are other issues that each one of them presents that are laid out for us, uh, especially in Leviticus, as well as Deuteronomy. And those are the a part of the first five books called the Pentateuch or Torah, the specific Torah. But the Bible is very clear. The law is holy. It is just. It is good. Well, then what's wrong with it? Well, what's wrong with it? It can't save you. And um, actually the law will condemn you. But here's the good news. The law, according to Galatians 3.24, is a tutor like a schoolmaster. A tutor to do what? It says to bring us to Messiah. So what is it? The law is a shadow, as it says right here in chapter 10. It's a shadow, not the image of the thing, but it's a shadow. The real thing is the person and work of the Messiah of Israel to which the law points. I can't tell you how many times, especially when I'm in Israel, that I have had an argument with an Israeli about this. I ask them, I say, what do you think of the law of Moshe? And they say, oh, you know, and I said, well, what do we do? Because you know it won't save us. It won't. You see, they do believe that it will save you. The exact opposite of the book of Hebrews. And they will always tell you, well, that was in the New Testament. The Christians have gotten a little confused. No, we haven't. We've read very clearly. The image of that is real. It's a shadow. It's not the real thing. The real thing is our Lord, the Messiah of Israel. Not only the image, (laughs) but the inability of Levitical sacrifices to do what these people think is being done. And they have to bring them back again. Why? Because we don't stop sinning. Have you noticed? Oh, you do? Watch all the three people who said yes. No, I'm just kidding you. There's another issue here, and that's the impossibility of having a clean conscience. Mm. 
The Bible says the worshipers in the, under the law, once purged or cleansed, should have had no more conscience of sins. But it's exactly the opposite. Because of what they did in sacrifice, it emphasized regularly to them that they're sinners. But it never gave them a solution of salvation through the Messiah. And uh, <laughs> that doesn't mean, by the way, that there wasn't any forgiveness in the Levitical system. There was. If you want to look at that on your own, Leviticus 4, lots of verses. But there was no complete cleansing. There was no stopping of remembering your sins. So you would call the cleansing um, partial. It, it was not complete. It was not final. And they'd have to do it again. So what was the intent of God behind all those Levitical sacrifices? And here's what we read. You got your Bible? Verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered if it did the job you think it did because worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But it was exactly the opposite. For in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins. Every year. Amen? Is everybody okay? So if you are kind of a committed to the law person, just understand, somewhere along the line, you're going to have to turn to the Messiah. He's the only one that can clean you up. Purge your conscience forever. And no more remembrance of sins. By the way, a lot of us are going back under the law because we do have remembrance of our sins. And we worry that God still remembers. After all, he, he knows all things. I had one pastor that I was listening to. I won't tell you who. But he said there's a giant screen in heaven. And when we get there, all of your sins will be shown on that screen. And everybody will see it. I mean, he scared the daylights out of the people there. I went up to him afterwards and I said, how long have you been disobeying God's word? He said, what? No, I'm the one that's given the real truth. I said, no, you're not. The law cannot save anybody. It condemns us. Oh, I feel so sorry for you. Don't feel sorry for me. I've already trusted the Messiah. There's no more remembrance of sins, and he will remember it against us no more. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Issue number two. First is the remembrance of sins. The second one you got coming in verse four, and that's the removal of sin. It's not just enough to not remember it. I want to know what happened to him. And here's what we read. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Sin was covered by Levitical sacrifices, but the removal of sin itself could only be done by the Messiah of Israel. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. John saw him coming at his baptism and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Oh my goodness. See, whether you believe it or not, the sin issue has been removed by the Messiah's death and all you have to do is believe in him in order to experience it. Amen. Wow. I say praise the Lord. What do you say? 
Amen? Issue number three. First, the remembrance of sins. Secondly, the removal of sin. Number three is the revelation of God himself. That's what you have here in verses 5 to 10. And um, it's a little cumbersome in a way. It's hard to understand. So I want to break it down, give you some ways to look at the revelation of God in this whole issue of you're not under the law, but you're under the grace of our wonderful Lord if you put your trust in him. So let me start by talking about his sacrifice. His sacrifice. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Now what we have here in verse 6 to 8 is the purpose of his coming. Wow. He said, in the volume of the book, it's written of me, I delight to do thy will. You prepared a body for me. By the way, you could search and search and never find that phrase anywhere in the Bible. Except here. Well, where did it come from? If you go to the passages that are quoted, it's not there. The answer might surprise you. It's found in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Apparently, that translation Paul used here because it was accurately saying what is the truth about our Lord. It's kind of interesting. Um, the word sacrifices for sin. Um, he's referring to two sacrifices, as I mentioned, the sin and trespass offering. But listen to this, the words of Isaiah 1.11. Big surprise. God says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? Wow. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. In other words, the inadequacy of animal sacrifices is emphasized over and over again. In Jeremiah 6, verse 20, to what purpose cometh there to me Incense from Sheba. Interesting passage. Probably referring to what the Queen of Sheba bought to Solomon. The sweet cane from a far country. Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor are your sacrifices sweet unto me. It's amazing how often we get this Clear-cut teaching. For example, Hosea 6, verse 6. I desired mercy, not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than all the burnt offerings. Wow. In Amos 5, verse 21 and 22, God says, I hate, I despise your feast days. These verses are not popular in Messianic congregations. They aren't. But it doesn't mean you don't honor the feast days, for God tells us to do that also. But if you think you can get saved by doing that, you are absolutely wrong. I despise your feast day. I will not smell your solemn assemblies where they have incense burning. You offer me burnt offerings and meal offerings. I don't accept them. Neither will I regard 
your peace offerings of your fat beasts. God said that. The Lord said that. How could we make a mistake? So his sacrifice is set apart. But there's something else. I give you a second thing here to understand. His submission to God's will. Wow. Very clearly presented in verses 7 to 9. In the volume of the book, it's written of me to do thy will, O God. He's talking to the Father. When he said, sacrifice offering, burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein which are offered by the law, then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Wow. By the way, King David believed that those words referred to him, and rightly so, for he was a historical type of the Messiah. Very interesting. Here's a third issue from verse 9, the last part of it, and that's not only a sacrifice and its submission to the will of God, but its substitution for the old covenant. Look, a lot of people do not want to read this, but it's in God's word, and it's in the discussion of what is once for all. Verse 9 says, He taketh away the first, that's the first covenant, in which there were many animal sacrifices. He taketh away the first that he may establish what? The second, which is the new covenant based upon the Messiah and his work alone. Um, his sacrifice, his submission to the will of God, his substitution for the old covenant. Here's a fourth thing that has become very controversial among Bible teachers. And that is, his sanctification. If I ask you, do you believe in sanctification? When I was in seminary, uh, we were studying this matter, and the teacher said, because he believed in present sanctification, he said, this is a process by which we can become more holy than we've ever been before. And he did it with such gusto. A lot of the students were saying, wow, that's something else, isn't it? How do you like that? And it came time for me to say something. <laughs> I said, there is no present sanctification. Oh man, the teacher came unglued. Well, this passage is teaching it. I said, no, it's not. You made that up. What it is teaching is that when we get saved and put our faith in the Messiah, we've already been sanctified. Amen. Why, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians six eleven that we've been justified, we've been sanctified, we've been glorified even. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's done. It's not done. It is done. Um, if you say, well, what proof do you have that the cause behind this is really that? Oh, thank you for asking. It says, by the which will. Look at verse 10 carefully. By the which will. Hmm. You know, um, it's easy to ignore the power of just a few words. Will you listen again? By the which will, meaning the will of the Messiah, we are sanctified. Now what it is is what we call an aorist tension Greek. It means a moment of time in the past. And that's when it was done. What does it mean to be sanctified? To be set apart. 
to be holy before God. Our position is holiness. Our position is sanctification. And in terms of becoming more mature, if we want to use those words, of growing in our faith, we are to grow in what? The grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, 18. Everybody following? What I just said is undoubtedly going to create trouble. I've done it before. And I've seen it. But by the way, he says, we are sanctified. Verse 10, do you see that? Now that's interesting because it's what we call a perfect, passive, participle. And what it, the way it translates in English would, we have been sanctified. Meaning it happened the day we came to the Lord and it continues. I am still sanctified, set apart, a saint before God in spite of all my inconsistencies. Amen? Be careful. And there's the Greek word in front of you. Not that you need that. We have already been sanctified and set apart. Set apart from what? Thank you for asking. That's a great question. And there is so much blessing if you get a hold of it. Our sanctification through our faith in our Messiah has brought sanctification to us. And um, it's a done deal. But what we are set apart from is the penalty and the power of sin. Now listen to me as carefully as you can. Because this is not easy. It wasn't easy studying it either. When we are sanctified by believing in our Lord, He sets us apart from the penalty of sin. Well, praise the Lord. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord. We realize that. But now wait a minute. We are all set apart from the power of sin, which is discussed in detail in the book of Romans. And that's where many of us are falling down, are not trusting the Lord for the sanctification that he has brought to us. Set apart from what? The penalty of sin. We kind of know that one. But we're also set apart from the power of sin. We do not have to let sin reign over us. Amen? Amen. For we are not under the law, but under what? Grace. Grace. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. I don't deserve to either be set apart from the penalty of sin, but I don't deserve for sure being set apart from the power of sin. Now, do believers who have trusted in the Lord, do they sin? Oh, they do? Uh-oh. Then we better go back to the law. Or do what? Romans says, count yourself. It's a mathematical term. Count yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto the Messiah, our blessed Lord. You know, this stuff is so fabulous. And there are many verses in the New Testament that help us, but we are sanctified or set apart from the penalty and power of sin by the Holy Spirit's work using the Word of God. The channel of it is the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. 
apart from the Messiah's death for our sins, there is no sanctification of the believer. This is what the Lord has done for us. And we ought to be rejoicing every day of our life. And the certainty of it all is those last three words. <laughs> Once for all. I don't deserve it. It's like every day I prove that I mess it up. But it doesn't change one thing. My Lord separated me for himself. I'm bound for heaven. He's encouraged me by his access provided by the death of his son by his access that I daily talk to him, my heavenly father. At his right hand, of course, is our blessed Messiah. And he continually intercedes for us. Do we need interceding? I guess so. What a great prayer warrior we have in our blessed Lord. Now we have one more. I said there were four issues here. What's the last one? The last one is the remission of sin. Remission means forgiveness. I not only want my sin removed, <laughs> but I want to be forgiven for everything I've said and done. Because I can blow it in one day faster than you can count. And maybe you know the same. That's what verses 11 to 18 is all about. Where remission of these is, verse 18, there is no more offering for sin. Wow. Now the problem with the old covenant, he mentions in verse 11, and it's kind of fascinating to see how he does this. He said, and every priest in the Old Covenant stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. This is unbelievable. I mean, I, I can't get it out of my head. In Greek, it's what we call a mende construction, which if you said it in English, it means on the one hand, da 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 but on the other hand, da-da-da. In other words, on the one hand, we got all the law, all the sacrifices, all of that, but none of them works for what we're asking for. Only our Lord does. On the other hand, we have the once for all sacrifice of our blessed Messiah that takes away all of our sin. Amen? Amen. And you see the priests in the Old Testament, there weren't any chairs. Boy, I wouldn't like that. With, with the pain often in my legs, I... Mm. Every time I think about it, I think about a Chinese doctor friend of ours that we'll see soon in Hawaii in a conference. But uh, she told me when I went to her radiology department and had this study of my legs, she told me, she said, there's nothing wrong with your legs. You got good legs. I said, they don't feel that good. Well, she said, I'll tell you why. I've been watching you. She said, when your knees are higher than your bottom, you're in trouble. Is everybody listening? Especially you men that are having trouble. If your knees are higher than your bottom, you're going to have trouble moving around and getting up. That's why you should always try to make sure you sit down in a chair 
where <laughs> your knees are below the level of your bottom. Amen. This is a good chair. <laughs> okay. In the tabernacle and temple, those priests could never sit down. There weren't any chairs at all. And then to, to emphasize this, to help us understand what we're talking about here and remission of sins, he said, your Messiah sat down. Chapter 1, verse 3, and then now again in chapter 10, verse 12. Now, will you look at chapter 10 in your Bible, verse 12? This man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins, what's the next word? Did you know that it's impossible to figure out which the word forever is connected with? That's the way the Greek reads. It's just loose, standing by itself. What does that mean? It means that the one sacrifice for sins was forever. So it's a blessing. But it's forever that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. That's true also. So you got a double blessing here. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. I love it. Okay, that would certainly show the preeminence of the Messiah. And in verse 14, it says, by one offering he has perfected, what's the next word? Forever again, them that are what? Sanctified. sanctified. They're already sanctified. So the perfection is already there. Did you know as a believer in our Lord, you are everything God ever meant you to be. Did you know that? Don't ever lose sight that it was by the once for all sacrifice of our Lord. We've been perfected forever. <laughs> Doesn't feel like that most of the time, does it? What wonderful words of these. The past is the penalty and power of sin. Well, is there any future sanctification? Yes, there is. There's no present sanctification. There's only past and future. What is the future that we are set apart from? And I love this. The past were set apart by the penalty and power of sin. Both. What about the future? The future refers to the presence of sin. I don't know if you've really caught this, but you know that your Bible tells you there isn't going to be any sin anymore. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, if there's somebody in this room that treats you poorly, but they're believers and you're believers, guess what? The Lord's already solved it. So stop being mean. Amen? <laughs> oh, you talk about blessing. Wow! We've been sanctified not only from the penalty and power of sin, but also from the very presence of sin forever. And then he gives us some proof from the Old Testament for the Holy Spirit of God is the witness and the work of God himself is what does it. Oh, by the way, the covenant, the new covenant does not depend upon two parties, but only one. So it's different from all previous covenants. It's God himself. He's the only one. And he can't lie. And as we learned from chapter 6, he is immutable. He cannot sin. He guarantees the promise. And the wonder in the whole thing is that it's going to be an inward change inside of you. You will have no recognition 
no care or concern whatsoever about sin anymore. When we get to glory, there'll be no more pain, no more suffering in His presence. There's a little chorus that says, In His presence, fullness of joy. At his right hand, pleasures forevermore. Oh, what fellowship divine. I am his and he is mine. In his presence, in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Sorry about the scratchy throat. There's a principle established to end this all. Verse 18. Where remission of sin is. Remission, wherever it is. If there's forgiveness, then there's no more offering for sin ever again. Because on that tree that he was nailed to what did it say on that sign from the word of God it is what finished, finished. perfect passive by the way it happened in the past but has present finished results forever and ever and ever I say hallelujah. What do you say? Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. The once for all sacrifice of our Lord. We're not under the law. We are under the grace of God and how we praise your name for it. And I pray, Lord, that those who are watching or listening by streaming live or sitting here in the auditorium who are not really sure of their relationship with you and your son. Lord, may that be the decision we make now. The commitment to our blessed Lord. We love him. We trust him. He has paid for it all. Thank you, Lord. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.